What you just heard is Franz Liszt Liebestram. And since all music tells stories, this one is a love song that says, love as long as you can, because the hour will come, you will stand at the grave and mourn. And who'd have thought that such beautiful, passionate melody has such deep meaning? So what I'd like to do today is tell you my story, like many of us today are doing, and not just the Facebook profile version of it, but a much deeper story that actually not many people have heard before. And so, since we're talking about fearlessness, what does it mean to be fearless? And in my life, fearlessness coexists very tightly with looking outside the box and breaking the boundaries of the tradition, and a lot of the times, breaking the rules that are said by others. <laughs> so what fuels that fearlessness are two big components, and one is our innate ability, something we're born with. So I was, I believe I was born with a musical talent, right? But I soon learned that I was not made for sports. And then, of course, there's the environment. So our family, our friends, and the society that we live in. And then we combine these two, and we either choose to just survive minimally with what we have or ignore all obstacle courses on the way and excel and succeed to the maximum capacity with what we've got. So after hearing so many beautiful stories today, a whole new meaning of what I was gonna say next came. I was truly lucky to be born to my mother. And She's an incredibly inspirational woman who I truly believed was fearless. I also protested when I was little as one of my innate abilities, <laughs> and I refused to take a pacifier immediately when I was born. And then when I was about nine years old, I decided that becoming a pioneer, which is like the Girl Scouts of communist Russia, um, just, you know, against 4,000 people in the school that were doing that and millions of others doing it uh, in the country, I decided that that wasn't just for me. You know, it did not make sense to me and I did not see how that organization would benefit me in a positive way. So I raised my hand and I said, I am not ready, I'm not going to do it. And of course, later I found out that if this happened a couple years before that, my parents would probably have been sent to jail. But I took the risk. <laughs> And um, <clears throat> when my mother decided that she wants me to study music, my grandparents, who were professional opera singers, they were absolutely horrified. Because in their opinion, a five-year-old child is supposed to sound like Maria Callas, or you just don't bother doing it. But my mother protested and said, you know, she had very strong intuition for me that I was supposed to become a performing artist, so she made sure that I practice. And even if I stopped for one minute, I would hear a nasty voice coming from the kitchen. Which meant I don't hear any music. So <laughs> as far as my environment goes, um, or went, as much as I loved my father, he unfortunately neglected his responsibilities towards us and had given himself to drinking quite a lot which uh, led to many years of unpleasant situations and sometimes tragic stories. So when I was about 10 years old, my mother broke her leg and she could not take me to school, which was an excruciatingly difficult um, ride for an hour in the city of Moscow through the subway system. So she sat me down and she diligently explained to me step by step on what I was supposed to do and to get there. And she fearlessly sent me out, knowing that nothing will happen to me. So her trust in me and my father's actions, or lack thereof, turned me into a very grown-up, very responsible, and very independent grown-up 10-year-old. And then later, we decided that we're going to prove our grandparents wrong. And so I got into this piano competition, international piano competition. And it took me about 10 years to get ready for that. Oh, 10 years. <laughs> no, that didn't happen. Oh, a year to get ready for the first round. And we absolutely neglected to think of a possibility of me passing the first round. Well, I did. 
So ahead of me, we had five days till the second round with nothing learned. And so instead of giving up and just saying, well, good job, you did what you could, my parents and my teacher locked me up for 24 hours. All together, they would bring us food, and we practiced and learned everything in five days. I was about 13 years old at that point, and we achieved the impossible, or what seemed was going to be impossible. And I went on stage and I played. It was okay. <laughs> so that was the greatest lesson of fearlessness that the child could have at that point. And then a year later, we moved to America. Was, and I still think of that time as the most difficult time of my life. But here in America, we all know how it goes. We didn't have any money. I didn't have friends. I didn't speak English. And at that point, music has become everything to me. And I knew that from that point on, I had to do absolutely everything possible to fight for it. So despite of what many people around us told me was, well, you know, music is not going to get you anywhere. You should not have it as a career. And <clears throat> you should just stay in Orange County and enjoy the beautiful weather and the beach. But I decided to go to a boarding school in Michigan. And then many people told us that classical music is not being supported in America. Well, then I received over $200,000 worth of scholarship money to study music. And two years when I was in New York, when I was in New York, I was told that I was supposed to sleep my way up to the top or to get into a musical competition or get a traditional manager. And then Three degrees later, uh, one from Manhattan School and then USC and Colburn, I was told that at that point, I was too old to make an impact as a performing artist. So what the hell was I supposed to do? <laughs> and <clears throat> I hated those competitions because I do not believe in music being turned into sport. You know, I, w I would go and, and fight against those other artists to prove to them that my fingers run faster than theirs, there was something really majorly wrong with that picture. We forgot what music is all about in the first place. It's supposed to affect us, you know, with its passion and soul behind it and not be a sport. So for me, it was completely wrong to go and do those, but I did try. But somehow, fate would have it that every time I would show up, something absolutely horrible would happen. So on my way to Vegas for a competition, I got a speeding ticket. And then in Chicago, my luggage was lost. In New York, literally, the pedals fell off the piano. And then I had this absolutely disgusting pervert in my host family where I was staying. I mean, <laughs> it just goes on and on and on. I was not meant to do that. So after all those torturous experiences, I realized that I'm not meant to fit into those classical mindset. And I had to create my own unique path because I needed to know that my existence can be fruitless, fruitful, <laughs> and meaningful. So <clears throat> many pianists would probably not think of playing in a comedy and magic club, but I decided to create a concert series called Live at the Lounge and it was right next door to Jay Leno's show. And as most people say, well, you're not going to get any audience because people are interested in pop culture. Well, we were sold out. Every week for about a year, we had shows, and we invited over 130 international performing artists to play there. And people loved the atmosphere. They loved how low-key it was. And the fact that I introduced every single performer and made sure that the audiences knew them who they were as a person, as a human being, and the story behind them, and not just somebody who is hiding behind their instruments. And then that same year, I organized another concert series. It was called Artistic Voyage, and we benefited worthwhile charity organizations, another great passion of mine. And so I was able to invite these amazing musicians to play with me and benefit a great cause. And as most people in classical tradition would never even think of touching a digital piano. When I grew up, it was forbidden to have one because it was considered to be a toy that is a distraction from real practicing. But then I played this role in the instrument and I said, why not? 
Why can't we use it? It's a musical instrument. It does what I want it to do. It brings you know, amazing joy to the audience. And then why are classical musicians so afraid of technology? Why can't we use technology to our benefit and to go ahead and excel at what we're doing using what we've got and new things? So really, uh, you know, looking outside the box has given me absolutely incredible opportunities to share my joy and my love for music. Because otherwise, I would not see those boys in juvenile homes where we came and played Christmas tunes for them, and they sang along with us, and they said, this is the first time that we feel like home again. And then there was a guy in Memphis who said that it was the best hour of his life since his son was born about 20 years ago. There was a gentleman in Germany who wrote to me and said that he heard my music on YouTube, and it made him realize what he's been missing for the past 35 years of his life. And he went back to playing the piano and told me that it saved his life. And then there was a really awesome uh, heavy metal guy at Sweetwater Sound Corporation. We had a presentation there at 7 o'clock in the morning, and I played Chopin impromptu. And he told me that he cried throughout the entire thing because he remembered what it was like to be a boy starting to play the piano and falling in love with music. And then there was a cute little tiny Asian girl who came up to me with amazing eyes, and she said, I want to be just like you when I grow up. But it's not about me. It's about them. It's their stories, and it's their emotion that they have while listening to this music. It's their joy and happiness and suffering and pain. And we as musicians have to put the divas out of the equation and really believe in what music is all about. It's about passion and bringing that joy to our audience. I'm extremely grateful to all the people who have been amazing support to me and had positive influence, my loved one and my family, and those people who said, go for it and don't be afraid and do it. But I'm also very, very grateful to those people who came up to me and said, you cannot do this. Because what they did is they pushed me to fight for what I really wanted in life. I will never, ever forget the experience that I had in Chile. Uh, I played in Santiago, and I walked out on stage, and somehow this audience was so enthusiastic and excited about what they're about to hear, that this wave of emotion just flew on stage. And I was so overjoyed that I could barely hold myself. And I realized that tears were just coming down my, my cheeks. And I said, oh, I'm supposed to play. So I took a deep breath, and I closed my eyes for a second, and I started playing. And then, with every single note that I was playing that moment, I realized, Oh my God, this is it. I am living my dream. So I'd like to close with a quote from Oprah. She said that the greatest adventure we can take is to live the life of our dreams. And today has been yet another dream that came true for me because being part of this incredible experience is absolutely overwhelming. Thank you.